side. Don't worry. Gregory? Hey, you got All right. Hello, Joe Ryan, the pop in. My son, the one making the fun. I'm going to speak so fast, you're going to think you're going to think we did three hours in one hour. How's that? No, I won't go back. Yeah, you have the cord. Uh, yeah, whiteboard. You mean a real whiteboard? Yes, I'm going to get a kit that's set up on board. I got to look at my other two offices where I have. I had about three extra, but I do have a little one over here that I got to pay. We have a chair. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Put that anywhere. Okay, hurry up, hurry up. Come on, I want to get started. I'm already late. Poor Marie's got to go back and stop Donna from having a heart attack. <laughs> and that is not an easy task to do. Yes, and it's more of the emotions. Our branch manager is buying another new house in Hazlitt. She's trying to get back and cover because the poor woman is. Having a heart attack, and she's closing on it. She's going to pre-K for herself. All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Good. Good. Did everybody do their homework? Yes. Great. Now, the one homework that I'm collecting is the application. You guys bring it back today? Yeah. Well, it's not exciting, so we got to make sure you bring it back. Otherwise, I can't get you. All right. So when we're done, I'll collect all those, put the clip back on it. The other homework you did was. You all did a sample application on yourself. I don't care if you made up your name, you didn't get one, right? Brian, right? Uh, take a quick copy of this. And where's your application? Yeah. No, I want you to get yours. You want me to fill out a, a second? Yeah, I don't have yours. We'll get it. You make it done. So get another one. Make two copies of that. I have it. Bring it in. All right, so why don't we start with questions from last week? You didn't miss you missed a couple of cute stories. <laughs> yeah, stories that kind of explain the business in lay terms. So you're not really behind in anything other than filling out the application. So Brian will give you one, fill them open to all, and then you're going to pull the rest out for next week. This part of the course is going to be different than what you're doing online. The online is getting very technical in rules and regulation numbers. And as we go through, I'm going to get very technical, but I'm going to get very technical in relation to exactly how the application works, so that as we're going through and you're feeling to take more detail. So what will happen is, is you're going through the technical information on the computer. It's going to go through parts of the application as we are. It's going to go through rules and regulations. It's going to go through all the different stupid little things you need to know in terms of what you this came out. What we're going to do is the practical sense and how this information relays on you and the customer. Why does it think you fading in and out, man? Okay, so that's going to give you technical. It's kind of like if you take the course and pass it and you said, I'm going to be a mortgage guy, you'd sit down and go, okay, what do I do next? Well, first. Because it's only information, it's like going to college. Once you have all the information, you don't know what to do with it. No, someone's leading you in a job that you have to go. I remember, of course, if it's statistics, that's how I'm going to figure this out. Same answer here. I'm giving you the day to day practical sense so that you can start using it in everyday life. All right. Any questions from last week? Even from the stupid store? Anything about Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac? Anything about how it relates? Good. Now we're going to move forward. I have a question. Did he go over Jenny May, too? Ginny May is FHA. Oh, Ginny May is the actual institution that securitizes the national Remember, FHA doesn't lend you the money. What does it do? It ensures the money. Ginny May is the organization that's affiliated with FHA. The more we actually secure the money that we when we close the loan, we get $2 million, $5 million, $10 million of a pool of money. 
And we secure it with Ginny May, who actually they does back the whole. Back it. Back it. They don't back it. The insurance is backed by FHA HUD, um, housing and urban development. Ginny May is the financial vehicle that goes on Wall Street and says, we have $100 million of FHA loans rated this number, and then people invest it. And the same thing that Fannie Mae does, Fannie Mae is one institution. FHA is the government. I had the whiteboard, I drew a picture. That Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the actual companies you sell it to, and they do the pulling. Ginny Mae, we're the lender. So we work with Ginny Mae and we pull the money with them. And FHA, which is federal housing and housing development, who's in the right? I told you last week, and you guys already know him very, very well. Well, Ben Carson. Ben Carson has been the director of the I'll take that picture. So they you know, through the loan, come up with the guidelines. Jimmy oh, yeah. a financial vehicle that we securitize the money and put it out on wall. Oh, you gone? Okay. Any so, other questions? Are you gone? So the reason why I use and, and I've done it with Wayne for years. The actual application is because this is the document that you're going to sit with your client, whether you do it on the phone, or you do the computer, whether you're using paper and pen like you did at home, to take a full application from your client. Everything that we need to know and we're going to need to know is going to be on this page. So we're going to go through an exact order, and when we get to certain issues, we're going to go into in-depth detail. We may stop at income. For, for a week and a half or a lesson and a half just to review all the different items that come and how to qualify. So that's why I had you write one on yourself. You now will go, oh, I thought it meant A when what that line meant was B. And don't be afraid to ask the question. You're all new here. Even Marie, who's been in banking, but she was in mortgage banking and follow up, we're all new here. So no questions are stupid questions. There's a rule out there that says the only stupid questions are ones you didn't ask. Because if you don't ask, you're going to leave and you're still not going to know. So ask a question, it's easy. All right. So if we started this and there's no more questions, we're going to get to the very first thing on the front. And it says, this application is designed to be completed by the applicant with the lender's assistance. Applicants should complete this form as borrower or co-borrower. Who's the borrower? The person borrowing the funds. A lot of occasions you have a husband and wife in the household. Nowadays, both people work. It's, we still traditionally put the husband up front, but a lot of times what you're going to do is look at it. If the wife makes 140 and the husband makes 50, you're going to put her up front. We try to put the the borrower who makes more money into the position of borrowing, and then there's a co-borrower. Now, you have borrower, co-borrower. Next thing I'm going to tell you is, if the two people, if me and Ryan were buying a house together as investment, you would actually complete two applications. We wouldn't put both of us on one. You really only put husband and wife on one. Because when you run the credit, you run it as husband and wife on one. If Ryan and I, or you and I, were investing in a property, we would complete two applications, run two separate credits, because I don't want my credit merged with yours, and we'll get into detail in credit later. We would have two. So that's very important. If your husband and wife, even if your husband and husband, wife and wife in today's world, if they're truly married, you would put them on one form. If they're not truly married, they're just partners, you're going to put them on separate forms. Okay? If I have a, a man and woman that are engaged and they're not married yet, we're going to put them on separate forms until they're married because I'm not going to run the application. Anymore. Okay? So it's not discriminatory a man and a woman. It depends on whether or not you're actually linked legally, okay? Because legally, when you're linked, whether you realize this or not, you can sign for your wife on documents of loans and lending, and she can sign for you. If you had a credit card, you can say, honey, can you sign? She can legally sign your name, and you can legally sign hers. That's part of that arrangement. I can't legally sign for Ryan now that he's 24, and he can't sign for me, nor can he sign for each other. Even though you guys may be brothers or cousins, you're separate individuals. You're not married. You're not married. Okay. 
So, bar and cobar, exit flicker. Cobar information must also be provided in the appropriate box check when, and then there's a box, the income or assets of the person other than the bar, including the, the bar's spouse, will be used as basis for the loan qualification or box. The income or assets of the bar's spouse, the person, the community property right for certain state law will not be used. Okay, so, little details. So, let's say you're married. And you've got decent credit, but your wife's credit's horrendous. You got married a year ago. She never paid her bills. The FICO score is two. <laughs> two. Real bad. Judgments, collections, or your wife's got a lot of debt. She's got a car payment <clears throat> and ran up credit cards, but she only makes twelve, fifteen thousand a year. Well, I may not be able to qualify because even though you make good money, I have to take her income, which is minimal, or none if she's not working and take all her debt and put on the application. Sometimes we make that decision that even though you're married, we're only gonna use one of the two as the borrower. The other spouse will have some legal rights, okay, based on the laws of the state of New Jersey or whatever state you're in. But I'm not going to use that borrower in this application. So we have to check off, yes or no, all the time. You will not even get past the computer if you don't check off one of the boxes when you want to disclose. So you are either not using income and credit of a spouse or you are using. If we were partners, right, one of you guys and I decided to buy investment property and your crap is screwed up but you have the money, well, we may make a deal that I'm going to do the loan, but you're putting up some money and we'll have our own agreement on the side. We can have an agreement of how we own the property, but legally, on the deed, I may be on them, we can add you later. So, those are the things that you will decide. Okay, so that's the very first thing. Who are we going to put on this application and why? Or who are we keeping off this application and why? Well, if you have 650 and 642, we're still going to use both of them together. Do I need, and the answer really lies into do I need the income to qualify? Do I, am I better off not using it because they have so much debt? And I'll, as I mentioned, we'll do it again. You have a car payment of 225, but she decided she wanted an Audi before you got married, and she's got an A4 and she's paying 599. But she's only making 15,000 a year, and she's got another 600 credit card debt. Not to mention student loans. So all of a sudden, we got $2,000 of debt and $1,800 of income. The, all that debt now has got to be carried by him or her. Or if she's got no job, he's got to carry all of it. Maybe she's collecting unemployment. Okay. So you look at the picture in total. I would say 80% of the time, both will go on the deal. And again, when we get to credit, that answer, I'm going to go into more detail, but I don't, don't want to divert from this top portion of this application. Question. That would affect the approval. The reason why you would not like, um, excuse why you would the approval. Correct. So it's based on your debt income issue. Exactly. So remember what we talked about last week, the four C's of lending. Credit, what's your credit like, what's your credit history, not what it is today. Capacity, your ability to repay the debt. And that takes into consideration your income versus the housing debt and your other debt. Got it? So that will come into the front ratio, the back ratio, top ratio, bottom ratio, housing ratio, total rate ratio. Be flexible in the terminology. Just understand the word ratio means the ratio between your debt and your income. Okay, when you guys catch them up, when you get a chance. Okay, but you're really not behind. Don't even worry about it. I know it's like starting football practice. They <laughs> still. <laughs> what the hell is that? They call the play. I don't know. I know. I get the feeling. I hated being the day leader. Dirt one day. So, your determining factor will be, does this person help me qualify or not help me qualify? You're making those decisions a lot on this application. Somebody's got most of their money in two bank accounts, but they got nine bank accounts. If I don't need the other seven, don't put it on because that's more work that we got to do to verify all the info. Same answer, okay? As you go along, you want the path of, of least resistance and the easiest approval process, you wanna make it as simple as possible. Honey, you don't have enough income, you got a lot of debt, the scores are real low, and the scores will determine your rate. 
and that's why we move or not move someone in. So you will either check the box and yes, you question. Now in that same scenario with the husband, like let's say maybe the, the maybe it's not so much that, but the credit is wrong. Then when we get the credit, we're gonna answer that. Got it? Good question. But I'm leaving everything in its own boxes. So when we get to that spot, we're gonna go through credit in depth. Well, I'm gonna have credit reports for everyone to look at. We're gonna white out the names to protect the innocent. You know how we do that? Why don't they protect the innocent? We're gonna have credit reports to look at. We'll go through it so you'll understand what a good one looks like, what a bad one looks like, and why. Okay? All right, so you're gonna check the box and say, yes, we're using it or not. Uh, but his or her abilities must be considered because the spouse or other person has community property rights pursuant to applicable law and borrower resides in community property state, blah, 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 blah. Now, since that is mentioned, if this is an application for joint credit bar covering each agree that we intend to apply for joint credit, sign below. Okay, now, every state is, has its own rules. That's why we have states. California is a community property state. New Jersey is an equitable distribution state. California, what community property means, you marry her, and you came to the table with five properties, including the house, and you bought a house together, she owns half of all your stuff, okay? That's why we have in California big prenuptial agreements. In New Jersey, it's an equitable distribution. If I came to the table with a ton of stuff, the only thing that matters together is what we own together. So if I had four properties separately, and then when we got married, I bought a house, that house is our community property. And then we bought a shore house, that property is our community property. The money in those accounts thereof, but this stuff is kind of held on the side naturally. The judges look at it as equitable distribution. Some states like California, no, it's all one thing. You're a movie, that's why basketball players, they don't even want to live in California because the rules that they have. Because they're like, what are you crazy? You got all of it? That's why Tiger Woods paid all that money out. Okay, so that's the difference between equitable distribution, community property, prenups are very, very important as well. And it's important here, okay? So the next thing is, they changed it in the last five years. They have an actual spot to sign for the bar to co bar the application on the first page. There was usually only one page, but they wanted to make sure that people didn't change information and do scams. Because look, if I got four pages and you're only signing on page four, I could take page one and change it, couldn't I? If I wanted to, I could do fraud. And that's why it's preventing fraud. Now this information in the front has those two lines for you guys to sign, okay? So if you didn't sign it, sign it. I want to make, oh, just sign the bullshit again, but I wanted everything done completely. So it verifies that everything on this page belongs to that person. Because all the other numbers don't really matter. The truth will out in the end. But if I change your name and your social security number, that becomes here. So you're verifying that that's you on this first page of the application. Okay? That's very, very recent. That came out in the last five years. Before that, you only signed on page four. Page four. Okay? And really, it was only two pages front and back legal side. They shortened it up for computer use, but literally these were legal size front and back. All right, now we get into some nitty gritty stuff. Type of mortgage and terms. What do you need, my brother? There you go. Perfect. Now the next box you're going to check off would be mortgage applied for. Now here's where as you as a mortgage expert, a loan officer who's been through training and understands what the products are, you're going to choose at this point, you have discussed the situation with the potential borrower, you help them get a prequal, so you know what type of program you're gonna use. So that first box, and, and understand this works because when an underwriter is looking at a file, they start at spot A and go to spot Z. If I look at the signatures first on the back page, what does that matter? I need to know what kind of loan we're doing. Because remember, we discussed that although, just like religion, the base core religion is the same, each different type of loan or each different type of religion has its own set of rules. Same thing here. As soon as I look at that front page and I look to see what's checked, I go, oh, we're doing a conventional loan. 
or a VA loan or an FHA loan. Now I know what the rules are in my head and I start thinking of that as I'm looking at the rest of the application, okay? So at this point, you will decide what type of loan it is. And remember, a VA loan. Can anybody get a VA loan? Only the veteran. No, you have to be a veteran, okay? And you have to have been discharged, um, what is that, honorably, and you have to have what's called the DD-214, which means a length of time of service and how much they will insure. VA is the same as FHA, guys. They are insure the loans. They don't lend the money. Okay. Because it was part of the system. So, VAs we discussed is a, is a government insured loan for people who are in the service. And some of the criteria there, very light overview for each one is, it's 100% financing. A, v, a person buying a house under VA will not have to put a down payment. Okay. So if you were buying a $150,000 house, based on your DD-214, if you qualify for that house, that they'll fund and insure that much, you don't have to put any money down. You now have to come up with your closing costs. The lending criteria is a little bit the same. They have a minimum FICO score of 620, which you don't have to worry about. When we go over those specific loans, you'll learn more. But basically, the key is you don't have to put any money down. FHA, you have to put down 3.5%. Okay, three and a half percent is a low number. Traditionally, conventional forced you to put five percent down. HUD said, Well, people earn a living, people make money. The hardest thing about buying houses is having the money to put the down payment. There was a time, probably in the early 70s, where you almost still had to put 20 percent down to go to a bank to buy a house, but houses back then were twenty thousand dollars. So you need $4,000 to put down. As the pricing got higher, they started coming with programs with less money. It's kind of like buying a car. Back in the old days, you'd have to put on a $5,000 car, maybe $1,000, 25%. And then you finance the rest. And they came out with leasing, put nothing down, financed the whole thing. So it's the same answer here. FHA is 3.5%. Conventional is traditionally 5% down. But to compete with FHA, They've come out with 3% down, but the lending criteria is a little bit tougher. The less you put down, the tougher the lending criteria. Now, we have some specialty products, but once you learn the base, then we'll get into the specialty products. Normally, conventional is 5% down. Normally, 5% down. So that would be the rule. USDA Rural Housing Service. Again, it's another agency similar to VA and FHA. It falls under the same guideline as HUD. It falls under the same um, management as, from HUD. But again, with rural, you have to be buying in a specific zip code that's considered rural. Does anyone know what the word rural means? Countryside. That's right. Oh. You're not buying in the city. City's called urban. The, if you live in most of New Jersey, it's considered suburban. So you have a city like Newark, and then anyone outside that would be suburban. Newark would be considered urban. And then if you go to Bergen County, Sussex County, out by 78, that would be considered rural. And not every spot, because if you got a center of town, a house in there may not be considered rural and be part of this. But one mile over, the guy has a house with two acres, and that could be considered rural. The good, the good issue there, the rules were almost identical to VA, and you don't have to put any money down there either. It's 100% financing. It was a way to get people to go back and maybe have a farm, okay, do some land. What, what loan is this for? USDA. USDA. So you would take this box off to... If you were doing a property that's is USDA that approvable and it goes by zip code mm -hmm. and by address, and you would not have to put a down payment. And the rules and guidelines are very, very similar to VA. Other. So now we have other. Other can be anything. You're doing a construction loan. I'm buying a house or I'm buying a piece of land and I'm doing a construction loan. You would check off other if it's just a construction loan. Or you're using alternative financing that we talked about. Institutions and people that go, hey man, we have all this money, but we don't want to deal with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all the rules from there. So we're gonna come up with our own guidelines. You got poorer credit, put 20% down, I'll still give you the money. Or you're racist, you're self-employed. 
I don't know if many people know this, but many self-employed people don't show all their income. They write all their expenses off. They gross 150000 but they wrote off the cars, and they wrote off the car mileage, and they wrote off their vacation to Tahiti with their wife and nine kids. And they wrote, all of a sudden, at the end of the day, they make $35,000. They can't really qualify for much. So there are programs out there that say, give me 12 months of your bank statements, personal and business. We'll use 100% of your bank statements personal, and we'll use 50% of your business to help qualify you. So if you're depositing 10,000 a month into your personal account, they're going to say, well, it looks like he makes 120000 a year. You're going to put down 10 or 15%, maybe 20 depending on what that guideline is. Instead of getting 4.5% on the rate, you may get 6.5%. But you got a loan as opposed to, how's that rubber stamper? No loan for you. You don't qualify. You only make $35,000. we are going to get into that in detail when we go over capacity and how to look at the tax return. We'll take a tax return for someone who gets a W-2 regular paycheck, you're working for Verizon, as opposed to someone who contracts to do all the wiring on his own business for Verizon. Verizon has linemen that work for them, and they also have subcontractors that they pay to go out, and he hires people. He may not be showing a lot of them. He could be grossing 600000 as a business, but he's only keeping 30000 He's paying everybody else. So again, when we get the capacity, we get to it. But that's where other would, would come into play. Anything other than the other products would be in other. Hard money lending, construction lending, things like that. Agency case number and lender case number. You don't have to worry about it, but what it means is this. Whenever you do a loan and it's FHA or USDA or VA, when you punch it into FHA, you got to get a case number before you can order an appraisal. The computer does it, staff does it, you don't get those numbers, but those numbers will be put into here. And again, when you open a loan, our computer system, our, our loan origination software, commonly known as LOS, loan origination software, we use Encompass. When you start the loan, it's going to pick up the sequence. You're in New Jersey, you're in this office, and the computer will pick that loan number for you, and it puts it in there. So those two numbers are nothing that you really need to worry about. It's just a matter of the computer will put the numbers in there. Now we get to the all important loan amount. To save time, I'll go right through it. So let's say Bob is buying a house and we're gonna do an FHA loan. And the house is $100,000. Without knowing all the details of FHA, we know he's got to put 3.5% down. So that means Bob's got to put down 3500 correct? Which means his loan amount would be 96500 There are other things in that property that change. I'm going to use a round number again. I'll help you out. Right. So once you put the down payment, 3500 I have to lend you 96500 because Mary, who Bob is buying the house from, is looking for $100,000. So Bob gives his down payment to the lawyer, and at the closing, his thirty-five hundred and my ninety-six thousand five hundred equal a hundred thousand, and Mary's paid. Simple answer. We have a lot more details that go into that for each program, but that's just a simple answer. If but this is the correct loan amount, don't you have to add? I just told you that's going to come into details when we go over the program. I'm just giving the basics. Okay, so. <clears throat> if you were putting 10% down in that $100,000, what's the down payment? $100,000 purchase, seven, seven, well, and I'm putting 10% down. What's my down payment? $10,000. What's my loan amount? 90 and 10 is what? 100. That's what Mary gets paid. Okay? So your loan amount would be based on minusing the down payment. The loan amount would fill up the number to get you to the 100% number to get the seller paid the, the contracted purchase price. Every loan's a little bit different. FHA has insurances that get added in to change the loan amount. But for argument's sake, it's not on every loan. Conventional loan, 100,000, 10,000 down, $90,000 mortgage, there you go. That's the basics of what you need to understand about what the loan amount is, okay? 
Interest rate. Interest rate is the actual rate that you're charging the borrower on that loan. So if the interest rate is 5%, you would then calculate your mortgage, 90,000, 10,000 down at 5%. And then the next number comes into play, which says number of months, correct? See that line next to it? Traditionally, most loans are 30 years long. And how many months is 30 years? There you go, 360. 12 times 30, 360. So you would put the rate of 5% in 360 months. If I was doing a 15 year loan, how many months would that be? 180. It's always good to have a brainiac and you notice it's a woman. <laughs> so we have one really smart girl in this class. Give me 500. There's two other smart girls. Oh, I'm just, uh, they're very smart, but they don't talk. They don't talk. We're gonna, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to give them their accolades later. Now, how we come up with the rate and how you come up with the term, we're gonna discuss later. But for right now, the rate, we just picked 5% and the term is 360. I'm gonna tell you 95% of the time, people want the 30 year rate because they're trying to buy as much house as they can. Lately, we've been doing a bunch of refinances where people go, hey, I don't wanna pay for 30 years. They want a 15 year loan, okay? Why? Because when you calculate interest over 30 years on 125, dollars $150,000 loan, you're paying back $450,000. Or cut that in half if I only pay for 15 years. You're gonna save $100,000. So if you can afford to make the higher payment, think about how old, how old are you? 21. So let's say in three years you buy a house, four years, you're how old? 25. After 30 years, how old are you? 55. 55. In 15 years, how old are you from today? In 15 years from today? I mean, from, from 25, from when you're 25. Uh, 40, 40. 40. So he could be paid off with his mortgage at 40 years or at 55. What do you think is better? 40 years. But most people don't buy the Honda at 320 a month. They buy the BMW at 720 a month. Same answer. We're all reaching and striving for the bigger number. Are these on simple interest? No. They are, they are not compound interest, but it's interest that's calculated from a mortgage standpoint. And what happens is just like a car, you're paying most of the interest up front. So when, let's just take an example that your payment on $100,000 is 5%, it's 555 a month. It's close, it might be like 490. But let's use 555 a month. Almost $450, $470 is gonna be interest on that first payment and the other hundreds at the end. But on year 20, 450 of that is, it, is interest, I mean, it's principal, and only 50, 60 bucks is interest, which is why I tell people all the time when I'm refinancing for them, how long are you gonna be here? Or why are you refinancing? I could make a lot more money if I just do what's best for me, but I don't. So if you've been in the house for 18, 20 years and you're doing a refinance and you say, well, I just want to lower my rate. Well, if I really look at your principal and interest at the 20 year payment, you're paying way less interest than you were on year one. So on that $900 payment, let's say 650, 700, maybe the principal and only 200 interest where if I refi that loan and save you $50 a month, we just revert it back to day one and 750 is gonna be interest and 150 will be principal. So I, I asked them, why are you refinancing? And they may say, well, I need some cash to get my kid in college, or I'm running into financial hardship, I wanna refinance and lower my rate because I'm selling in three years. Well, now I understand why they're doing it. If they just tell me, well, I just thought I'd get a lower rate, I tell them, well, I could give you a lower rate, but the effective rate that you're really paying now is less than the rate I'm gonna give you, which is gonna lower your number, because that payment was based on day one, not day 20. Do we get that concept? Don't be afraid. So you can it, ask questions. So it changes as the years go by? It changes every month. Every month. Every month you make a payment, so it's almost like an inverted yield curve. Interest, day one, principal here, $1,000, 850, 150. Every day it does this. Every month you make the payment, it does this, and all of a sudden it changes. So that 
towards the end of the loan, you're paying all principal and the interest is very low. I really, really take a lot of time to help my clients because I find when I teach them this, guess what happens two weeks later? They refer me somebody. They might refer me to somebody because instead of just making money for me, I help them do something that was right for them. And they're like, this guy could have written my loan, but instead he showed me that I shouldn't do it for whatever the reason is. And I get, they gave me two more people to help and try to get into a home or refinance them. So some days it works your advantage to really look at what the client's needs are and make it work for them. Is the only way to beat those interest charges was to just pay more money in this case? Not, it really doesn't make a difference on how many times you pay. No. What happens is, as opposed to simple interest, simple interest is fixed. So what happens is that year one, $100,000 loan, 5% is $5,000. $5,000 is divided over 360, and it stays the same. It's level. So you're going to put a principal into it with it. And that's either interest only or simple interest. The following year, you now owe 90000 instead of 100. That 5% is calculated over 90. And your interest actually goes down. Even though it goes down in all of them, you're paying the same number. So simple interest is a cheaper way. Many student loans used to be simple interest. Mortgage calculations are a lot like vehicle calculations where they do it the other way. So what happens is you're still paying the interest based on the principal balance. So as long as you write on your pay on your, on your um, mortgage stub, $200 to the balance, all of a sudden on the following month, you were supposed to owe $840 to interest, but because you paid $200 off, you owe, well, don't, don't get crazy now, $838. Why? Because I paid $200 more of the balance. It's not going to drop it by $200. Bucks. Take 4% take interest times $200. It's $8, not even. It's, it's 8 bucks. So what happens is <clears throat> you now paid more to the principal in that regular payment because your interest was really less because you lowered the principal balance. So a lot of times I tell my customers, look, don't go for the 30 year more. Don't go for the 15. Take the 30 and do this. Make, I tell them, take one twelfth of their mortgage payment and add that to here. So what happens is at the end of the year, you've made one extra payment. So if you owe 1200 a month, that's your total payment with taxes and insurance, make an extra hundred. So at the end of the year, you paid a whole month ahead. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have what's called a bi-weekly. There's separate companies that do it, and they don't do it the right way. But in truth, if you paid your mortgage twice a month, you've paid half that mortgage off before it was due. So again, it drove your principal down so that your interest drops lower. And what happens is instead of paying in 30 years, you'll pay off in 22, maybe 24, maybe 21, depending on how much you pay. If every year, and I tell my clients this all the time, look, January 1, don't make one payment, make two payments. Why? Because you get the benefit of that whole extra payment for the whole year. You just say, you know what? I'm going to save up a couple bucks and every January, instead of paying 1200 I'm going to pay 1200 plus 1200 to principal. That did more than paying the extra 100 every month because you paid $1,200 down in that first month so that every month thereafter you pay, all of a sudden the computer's going, mm, he doesn't owe X, he owes X minus 1200. So that extra money is now going to your principal. So not only are you paying less on the interest, but that principal gets driven down even further beyond the 1200. You might actually drive that down another thousand dollars over the course of the year, okay? And that's exactly how it works. So I've calculated if you do that, you're gonna be somewhere as around 20 years on a 30. If you pay the 100, you'll do it like 22, 23 years. But if you take $900, because it's principal and interest, and multiply that by 12, somebody do 900 times 12. So I'm gonna say you pay the mortgage off in 22 instead of 30. So it's 900 a month. How much is that? 10,800, multiply that by eight, because I paid my house off in 22 years. How much did you just save? You just gave it to me. I say, I stopped paying. I paid off the house because I did this in 22 years. 22 minus 30 is what? Eight. 
So if my payment was 900 a month, how many payments are in a year? 12. 12. 12. Eight, 900 times 12 is? 10,008. 10, how many years was I supposed to pay? 30. 30. I have eight left. Times 10,008 times eight. Times eight. <clears throat> I just saved 86400 over those next eight years. Wow. That I could take that money now and put into my bank account or invest in a property or whatever. But you can actually make money with it as opposed to pay money out. That's the power of compound interest, thus the power of not paying. The best way to save on this is just pay cash. Not too many of us have that ability. Or pay it off as quickly as you can. Get it done. A lot of people do that. They want to get rid of their mortgage so now that they can use that money for other ventures. Any questions on that? Does everybody get that premise? All right. So we did the loan amount. We did the interest rate. We did the number of months. We did the amortization type. Nope, that's what we're going to do next. Amortization type. That means what type of loan in the type of loan are we doing? Okay. Amortization is actually how are we paying off that mortgage? Now, we have a number of boxes to check. Fixed rate. Does anyone want to take a stab at what a fixed rate loan is? 30-year fix. Go ahead. 15-year fix, anything that has an so, so describe for me, if you, for someone who came from the planet Mars, and they said, well, yeah, you're telling me it says fixed rate, and you're telling me you fixed for 30 years, but what does that mean? It means it's fixed to the life of the loan. The, the term of the loan. Give me what that means. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't your payment is always going to be the same unless you have an increase in your property taxes or homeowners. So your mortgage payment, the and principal and interest, interest, will always be the same. That's what I'm looking for. The interest will never change from the day you start the loan to the day you pay off the loan. And thus, your principal and interest payment will never change from the day you start the loan to the day you pay off the loan. Because you've got you borrowed a hundred thousand at five percent for thirty years, so that principal and interest payment will never change. Your taxes may go up, your insurance may go up, but that has nothing to do with your principal and interest. Yeah, but are you allowed to refinance that? You can refinance anytime you like. Only time it changes. But that doesn't change. It's a whole new loan. So well, I'll give you an example. Uh, what are you driving? What year? 2005, you getting tired of it? I'm ready to see. Oh, that's right. So are you going to replace it? Well, I'm saying when you get tired of it, what are you going to do with the car? Are you going to buy a new car? Yeah. What do you think you want to buy? That's good. So you're going to have a whole brand new car. Same thing when you refinance your loan. You didn't change it. You went and got a whole new loan. That loan is paid off. It's gone goodbye just like you're accurate. It no longer exists. You paid it to Bob's mortgage company, whatever it was, you took a whole new loan. You're not changing it because there is a term that refers to changing it. And that would be, what's that term? It's sticking in the side of my head. They do that when you, modification. Okay. A modification is when you have the same loan, but the bank says, okay, we'll give you a little rate because we don't want to lose a loan. You don't change the day you started, the day you went. They just change something in the middle. It doesn't happen that often, but it can be done. You, when you do a refinance, is you're taking your Acura and you're trading it in for an Escalade. Whole new loan. Could still be a fixed rate loan, could still be an FHA loan, but it's a whole new loan. It's not just changing it, okay? So amortization stands for two parts of the number. How many years and how are we paying it? What's the product vehicle? So like we just talked about this Acura, you have Acuras, you got Lincolns, you got Hondas, you got Toyotas, mortgages come in different product types. Fixed rate loan is the one we use most of the time, but many times there are other products. So if we look at the box, it says right below fixed GPM. Now they keep putting it there, but I haven't seen a GPM loan written forever, but it's going to be on your schooling and it's going to be on your test. So GPM stands for graduated payment mortgage. Oh, I'm right, I'm right here. Okay. Graduated payment mortgage. This is the only time 
other than the course that you're taking and the test you'll take that you're going to need to know what this is because it's fell out of favor for a while. But here's what it does. Uh oh, you're showing it. Okay, so here's what it does. A graduated payment mortgage was a way to help somebody get into a house today, knowing that they're going to make more money later. So I'll give you an example. You just graduated medical school, law school, you just graduated college. Forget about student loans because 25, 35, 45 years ago, that wasn't too big of an issue. When Joanne graduated, he owed maybe 15,000. When I graduated, I owed 10. Am I close? Okay. So, <laughs> exactly. So the, the answer is you got out and you got your first job and the first job I might've got a paycheck of 15,000 a year, which is pretty good back then. Okay, 1978, 80, 84, making 15, 20,000 a year wasn't great, but hey, I'm a kid, I only got a car, I'm living at home, not too bad. So now you wanna buy a house. Well, I'm in whatever job I'm in and they know you're gonna make more money so what they did was they created a mortgage payment that started lower, okay? And what they did was, even though the rate was the same, so let's say my rate was 5%, they gave me a rate lower for seven years of the payment. So you paid 7.5% less of what that payment was. So if that regular payment would have been 900 a month, I'm only talking about principal and interest, 900 a month, I would start paying 650 in the first year. Then in the second year, I paid seven and a half percent more. So I paid about 692. Kind of like getting a raise in your rent. You rent an apartment for 650. Landlord says next year, bro, gas went up, electric went up, water went up, I gotta charge a little more. Year three, I'm now paying 725. Again, they added seven and a half percent. So I'm gonna use a real number. If I started at 650, the next year, I go plus 7.5%, and at six, wow, what did I say? What number did I say? 698. It's 698.75, I remember. Plus the next year, 7.5%, and it's 751. Third year, plus 7.5%, and it's 807. Fourth year, plus 7.5%, so what are they doing? They know every year I'm gonna get a raise because I got a pretty good job, okay? So every year, they got me in the house at 650, okay? And even though I was creating negative amortization, write that word down, boys and girls. We're gonna come back to it. Negative amortization. It's right on your page, amortize. Okay? So all of a sudden, by year four, that 868 is what I should have been paying all along. That's what the payment would have been, 868, had I paid the 5%, but 100,000, I'm just making up the numbers, I should have been paying, but they let me pay 650. What happened to that interest that I didn't pay? It gets added, I, on. It gets added on to the back of the loan. Now, for three more years, they go up for the full seven years. So plus 7.5%, plus 7.5%, plus 7.5%. And at the end of the day, that 858 became 1078. Why? Because just like the interest neg -M, the interest started here, but you were paying here. The interest stayed here, but you now owe the difference from this payment up. So you're paying less, paying less, paying less, paying less. Then all of a sudden you got the three, three and a half, four, you broke even, and then all of a sudden you did this because you had to catch up on all this interest here, right? Because we started here and went like this. All this interest got added onto the back. But the last three years, you went up to here, and this extra money is paying off all this bad interest. So it almost looks like a triangle yield curve, okay? And that's a graduated payment mortgage. Normally what we did by the time we got to that point, we refined them out paid off the debt because the house was worth more. He made more money. And then we actually got him back to a normal number. He financed, he financed his own ability to move into the house. That product was very, very popular between the middle 70s and the middle 80s for about 10 years. A bank called Citibank, which is still in existence today, offered that product almost exclusively. 
not too many other banks did it, but, but it was a very, very popular product. I must have put 100 people in a year at that product level because they all got jobs, but they just weren't making enough, and we got them in. Is that considered a PAR? Is that considered a PAR? P-A-R? Mm, not that I know of. Graduated papers, or GPM. But I'm not sure what PAR is. PAR is, PAR is a different term that we use, but it could have been. Another bank could have called it a PAR. I don't, I don't know. Okay, so let's look at the next one below. On the right of it, it says arm. Uh, it doesn't mean your arm. It means adjusted, adjustable rate mortgage. That's another product that kind of helps the people, but it also helps the bank. An adjustable rate mortgage is a mortgage that for whatever the term that you write it for, will adjust at specific periods. So we'll go over the basics. Most arms could be one-year arms. So let's say we started that 5% rate loan in a normal time at 3.5%. Okay? So you're going to pay a mortgage based on 3.5%. But every year, if it's a one-year arm, it could adjust up or down by 2%, depending on what the markets are doing. Okay, so you've got a couple real, real important things that go along with an arm. So make sure we write on the, on the left side of the page, ARM equals adjustable rate mortgage. If you didn't do it, do it. Below it, I want you to write the word margin, M-A-R-G-I-N, put equals profit to the bank. Below that, you're going to write index, I-N-D-E-X, equals what the bank paid for the money. And below that, you're going to write annual, A-N-N-U-A-L, second word, cap, C-A-P, equals yearly change below that you're going to write total cap equals max change and we'll go back up to the top so ARM and, and arms are becoming more prevalent over the, over the last five and a half, six years, seven years since CFPB came out, nobody was lending on arms. The rates were way off because the interest rate on the fix was real, real low and it was artificially low. And when I explain to you a little bit about it, you'll understand. But now when we get into it, the rates are starting to change a little bit. So ARM, adjustable rate mortgage, it means that your rate Unlike and the opposite of fixed rate mortgage, your rate will change at whatever period that agreement is, okay? And that means your payment will change at the same time. So if you have a one-year arm, every year that rate could change. It could go up and it could go down. And it could stay the same. If you have a five-year arm, it will change once every five years. It could go up, it could go down, and it could stay the same. Uh, what, what influence? That's what we're going. That's okay. what the rest of the words mean. If you have a seven-year, ten-year, nine-year, thirteen-year, one day, you can have a monthly arm. When will it change? Once every month. Every month. Does anyone have an example of what a monthly arm would be on something that most of you probably have? Vacuum. Well, vacuum. You, ooh, your vacuum. Okay, I like that. He actually picked the product. Most of you will probably have something in your pocket. That's based on monthly arms. No, cell phone isn't financed on an arm. How many has a credit card? You got a credit card? That rate can change by the day. Every month, your rate on your credit card changes. Not your ATM card, because that's your money. There's no interest on your money. On a credit card, that rate can change every day. 
anyone ever takes a look, most of y'all have seen commercials 5%, 7%, 0%, but that's only a short period of time. Most credit cards are sitting between 12 and 29%. And you're paying that every month it changes. Okay? There are a couple of mortgages that were just like that. They're called option arms. Save that for another day. All right. So we have arm. What was the line under it that I said? That's profit uh, margin. All right. So the margin, I should have actually did it the other way around. Let's go to index first. The index is the product that the bank is tying the arm to to charge you the rate. So the index is the actual loan vehicle. So we have out there what's called the LIBOR, which stands for the London Index Business, blah, blah, blah. And then we have the T-bill, which is where most of it is, okay? We have one-year T-bill, three-year T-bill, five-year T-bill, 10-year T-bill, 20-year T-bill. And the T-bill stands for Treasury Bill. That's put out by the government, okay? You also have something that's called prime rate. That's the rate that the Fed puts out for the banks to borrow their money at. So you could be tied to any of them. The most common would be either a T-bill or a LIBOR, okay? T-bill is based out of Wall Street. The LIBOR is based out of the London Index. So we'll just use one. So let's say today, which I know what the um, five-year T-bill is at because I just did a five-year arm last week is 1.74%. So the bank is going to pay the going rate of 1.74%. That's the cost of the money that they're using. Got it? So the bank now is planning to lend you $100,000. I'm gonna lend it to you on a one-year T-bill, so it's gonna be a one-year arm, and I'm buying the money at 1.74%. So every month, I gotta pay Wall Street 1.74% to use this 100,000. The margin is what I'm adding to that loan. You bought, your dealership bought the Acura from Acura at 50,000 and they're selling it for 55,000. That 5,000 that they're selling it to is the margin of profit that the dealership is making. Vacuum cleaner, factory makes it for 100 bucks, they're selling it to the people for 220 bucks. They're making $120 on that $100. Got it? That's their margin of profit. Same thing here. So the bank, let's say, will charge 3 or 5% on the margin. Let's use 3 as an average number. So when we disclose to you, we're going to disclose that it's a T-bill, and the margin is 3%. So you're going to pay 4.74% for one year. Got it? T-bill or index <laughs> is the actual product that the bank is buying the money from to lend to you. And the margin is how much profit they want to make. So next year, the T-bill goes up to 2.74%. What are you paying if your margin is three? What rate are you paying? Brian? You don't know. 1.2.74 and three is what? 2.74 and three is what? So your rate of interest that you're paying is 5.74%. So the bank is saying, look, man, I'm going to give you the benefit of the lower rate, but you're in bed with me. We're partners. I'm borrowing that money at 1.74. If it goes up, your rate goes up. If it goes down, your rate goes down. Okay? And that's what an arm is. It can be tied to any number of indexes, and the margin is the profitability. <laughs> now, and the index is the actual product on Wall Street, that the bank is borrowing the money to lend to you. That's the bank's cost of funds, okay? Now we have annual cap. Well, you're a regular guy and you're making 50,000 a year, right? What if the bank's rate went up, the markets went crazy and the bank to the rate, the rate to the bank went up 10% in one year. So instead of being 1.74, it's 11.74. And now you got to pay three over it. You went from three plus 1.74, 4.74 to 13.74. Well, let's see if we can take a regular loan and see what that means. I'm gonna, I have a mortgage calculator here. And I'm going to go, let's take a look at an average house mortgage of about 200000 So when you bought the house last year at this time,
you financed 200,000 annual cap. So we're going to go to annual cap. So now I'm going to put 200,000 and it was 4.74%, right? So 200,000 at 4.7% over 30 years is $1,042. Write that down. Write all these numbers down. $200,000 mortgage. Your index, so write it in the index, is 1.74, one five-year T-belt. Your margin was 3%. So the rate we're using today is 4.74, and that mortgage payment is $1,042. So let's say we didn't have an annual cap and you were tied in just like the banks with your credit card at whatever they want to charge. And their rate went up 10% in one year. When you came due the next year, you're now paying 10% plus three is 13%, correct? What was the margin? The margin was 3%. So, you're living in a house, you're paying $1,042 a month for the mortgage. The very next year, they send you a bill for $2,212. You think you'd be able to handle it? Went up more than 100%. You're at $1,042, and it went up. So think about your regular lives on a day-to-day -day basis, kids, food, car, house, rent, everything. They send you a bill and say, hey, man, look, we got screwed. Rates went up. It went up 10%. Now I'm going to hit you up for your three. I, mean, I got to pay 10, and you got to pay 10 plus my three. You got to pay 13%. So that same $200,000 loan is not going to cost you $2,212. That's what makes people go into foreclosure. So the government said, we've got to protect the people while we're also helping the bank. Okay? Because the bank buys their money out in advance. So they said, look, we have to have an annual cap that kind of protects everybody, and then we have to have a lifetime cap. Most annual caps are about 2%. So your rate can't go up more than 2% in any one year. Now, each product is a little different, but I'm giving you the base, okay? And an annual cap usually is not more than 5%. I've seen a couple at six, but for the most part, you'll see two slash five, meaning, the first change is two, second change is five. Now, when we get into some of this stuff, we'll actually have a little bit more detail, but I'm giving you a basis to understand so that as we go down the road and we're learning more things in detail, you're gonna add the basis and then you're gonna learn the, the other stuff that goes along with it. There's a two, two, five, things adjust, go from a five year to a one year. There's all different changes that the bank does to make things work for them, make it good for you, make it enticing. But the basics is usually 2% annual cap, a 5% life cap. So that you're never gonna reach that 2200. You're gonna reach, if you started at 4.74, 4.75, the most you're gonna pay is 9.75, not 13. Even if it went up to 100, the most you're going to pay with the five cap is 5% higher than the day you started. We start at 1.74 plus three, 4.74 plus five is what? 9.74. Okay. So those are little fail safes so that people do not fall into foreclosure. They don't, they don't go bad. They don't do things like that. Okay. Perfect. 11.15, just like I said. All right, guys. Any questions in detail, the things we talked about in, in those boxes? Arm. Arm. Okay. What's your question? The arm stands specifically for the interest rate. So instead of being a fixed rate loan, what's a fixed rate loan? The rate never changes. The payment never changes. But, but the arm... Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying it was a constant 
fixed rate. Right. It's fixed rate never changes. The day you start the loan, the day you end the loan, you, you get that whatever rate that was. An arm is usually less than a fixed rate, but it could go more than the current fixed rate. But usually it'll be less than the current than the ongoing rates, but it could change. It can change by 2% in a year. It can go up or down. And it could change by 5% over the life of the loan. It could go up or down. Okay? No. The, 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 that's a very good question. In your agreement, there's always a specific date at which they use that rate so that you can't feel like, well, it was real high on that day. And even though I didn't change till here, they grabbed that rate. Normally, it's the month before you expire. So let's say you bought the house on April 1st. On May 1st, or whatever date in May that they tell you, whatever the T-bill is, the five-year T-bill, so your index is a five-year T-bill, let's say. On whatever rate the T-bill is on May 1st, a month before your change, some of, on my loan, it's two months before. Is it? I think they said the October before the change date. So let's just say one or two months. So if the T-bill goes to two, they send me a notice that on this date, on June 1st or July 1st or August 1st, your rate is two plus three. So you're at five and you're gonna pay this payment. So I get a notification two months before, because what they did was they set up a few months and said on November of the year, end of the year, we use that rate because I convert over, I guess, in February, and it gives me three months to look at it, and then I start making that payment. It's October and January 1. That's what they do. No matter what you do, that's your agreement. Bank said, look, man, you're my partner. I bought the money at X. If it changes to Y, you're, you're, I'm not making more money on you, but I'm, I can't make less money. I'm making 3%, period. Whether it's four, whether it's six, whether it's eight, if it goes down, if let's say we started at 1.74 and it went down to 1.24, well, guess what? Your rate went down from 4.74 to 4.24. So you actually went down, which I've had happen to me. It'll actually go down. So depending, so the bank's saying, if it goes down, you're my partner, you pay less. If it goes up, you're my partner, you're paying more. I'm going to make my same 3%. That's how the banks make their projections on how they pay their bills. That's the, an arm. The, um, the um, index, you so said the, like the actual product the uh, bank is paying? Yes. Paying so you can pay a one-year T-bill, so they'll change every year. A five-year T-bill will change. Well, your rate is based on the five-year T-bill, and each of those things in the index, we look in a Wall Street Journal, there's a one-year T-bill, there's a five-year T-bill, there's a seven-year T-bill, there's a 10 year Choice. Just so you guys know, don't go anywhere. Or did you guys want people? Oh, cool. Cool. Unless you gotta go. So for the yeah. T bill, the, the bank is getting that money from Wall Street. Right? Yes. So they getting from the capital. That's called capital markets. The capital markets is where Wall Street gets its money. Capital markets. So they get that. They get that money from, from Wall Street, and the spread they make on that is. Is whatever, the margin. Yeah, whatever, yeah. No, say the real terms. Oh, now on, margin. the spread they make is called the margin. the margin. It's the same thing in any business. I bought the Acura from the factory at 52000 They let whatever. me mark it up 3%, right? So it's 2200 bucks, but I can actually put more in if I want. I'm selling it for 57000 so I'm making $5,000. Right. That's what they put on the sticker, 57. They pay 52. They put it on the, on the floor 57, and then they negotiate from there, right? So, so you're saying, oh, okay, I get it. So you're saying once the bank gets that money and gives it to you, that they need to make their money back by charging. They, they need to make a profit because yeah, the bank is. isn't a charitable organization. That's, it, that's the interest. That's the, the money, interest. Right? That's <laughs> their money. Exactly. <laughs> if you need the roll, go. We're good because I'm just asking the question. Bye, so everyone. With, See you next week. So, with the T bill, you said you get the one, it's a five, it's a seven. Do you have a choice in order of choosing this? Yes. Remember, arms are your choice. There are always different products that are available. A one year arm is going to adjust every year. I'm not comfortable with it changing every year. I don't think I'm going to be in house more than five years, so I'm going to take a five year arm. Five year arm 
instead of being 1.74, might be, it is 1.74. So let's say the one year T bill is 1.2. So three on 1.2 is 3.2, well, 4.2. But a five year T bill is 1.74, so I'm at 4.74. But I know that payment won't change for five years. That's the thing, but if you do the year, that means it changes every year. It, it, it can go up, up yeah, or, or down. down. But if I do the five year, it's only going to change once every five years. Well, and if it goes up for that, that five years, it's based on the duration. You know, you've got that specific. Yes, same thing with the one year. At, at your anniversary date, whether it's one, three, or five, yeah. whatever it is at that date, that's what you're going to change up or down. But if you don't, let's say, let's say you go, I'm buying a condo. But I know it's not my permanent house, but I can afford this for now. And then if I have a kid, I'm going to sell. So you go, this condo is maybe my five-year plan. Mm -hmm. Well, you know you're going to be out in five years. Take the five-year arm. It's lower than a 30-year fix, but it's not going to change for five years. Maybe three, four years or five years, you sell it, and then you move into the new house, and then your payment never changed. Mm -hmm. Got it? Mm -hmm. These are the reasons why people look at this stuff. We have arms with big jumbo loans that we're offering at 3.9% because the bank wants an $800,000 loan, and they're fixed for five years at 39 30-year fix on a jumbo loan might be 4.75, so you're saving a point on that rate. Point on $800,000 is like nine, 1,200 bucks a month. So you're like, I'm taking a five-year loan because let me see what's gonna happen in five years. I might sell, I might be out. All right? What about a, a uh, LIBOR, LIBOR? LIBOR stands, and I don't get the whole thing right, but it's a London index, business, and I forgot the last word. But it's actually the cost of money that's the businesses in London. Now, the T-bill is a U.S. Treasury, and the LIBOR is a London, England Treasury, basically. Okay. The T-bill. The T-bill. T as a letter T, B-I space dash, B-I-L, L, T-bill. Treasury, it's called the U.S. Tre treasury bond. Treasury bond. Right. So three three year T bill would be a three year Treasury bond. That's what the bank said. That's what the Federal Reserve says. If you want to borrow money from the Federal Reserve for three years, this is the rate we're going to give you. And the rates are, are really adjusted by the capital markets. London Interbank. That's right. London Interbank, Interbank offered rate. Offered rate. London Interbank offered rate, which is which is London's version. Of Wall Street. Yeah. Offered rate. LIBOR. London Interbank Offered Rate. Got it? You good? Are you lost? Are you with me? You with me? You good? I kind of figured that. I don't get much response, so I'm about to drag it out of you. London Interbank Offered Rate, which is London's version of our T bill. And they have the exact same thing. One year LIBOR, three year LIBOR, five year LIBOR, seven year LIBOR, 10 year LIBOR, 15 year LIBOR. Just so you know, write this down. The, the United States 30 year fixed rate loan is based on the 10 year T bill. 30 year what loan? 30 year, our 30 year fixed rate loan, the rate is based off the 10 year T bill. So, what's the first question you're gonna ask me? Hey, you missed this. The U.S. 30-year fixed rate loan is based off the 10-year T-bill, which is Treasury bond. T-bill stands for Treasury bond. So why does our 30-year fixed rate based off the 10-year bond? Does anyone want to take a guess at that answer? So when you get a 30-year fixed rate loan, there is a 30-year fixed rate bond. We don't use that as our basis, otherwise the rate would be higher. We use the 10-year T-bill. Does anyone want to take a guess why? Because the rate to be lower? The rate to be lower? That's, that, they want, want the rate to be lower, but there's another reason that's tied with that. Make it more affordable? Right. Make it more affordable, but it has to have, you can't just do that without having a basis to base it on. You have to, the, remember, the bank doesn't want to lose money. So, so if they base it on a 10-year price and you hold the loan, for 30 years, if that rate goes up, they're screwed because their margin just got thrown out the window. So they based on it on like the average, the average, um, right? 
Average. Nope. Nope. Income. Nope. What would what would make the bank happy if you did something before that ten years is up? Pay it off. Pay it off. How would you pay it off? Three two reasons. Only two reasons how you, you got, pay you got the got three reasons how you, extra, you paid it off. You, pay extra, but, you paid extra oh, and paid yeah, it off. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What's the other way to pay it off? You took a refinance and paid them off. Refinance. So you paid it off early with your own money. You refinance and number three, you sold the house. So the national average used to be seven and a half years that people lived in the house. They either moved, sold, refinanced. It recently went down to six. Okay. So most people don't stay in a house or keep the same loan for more than six years. So they're like, well, why are we why are we basing this off the 30-year bond if we're not making money too? Because people don't even stay in the house 10 years. Okay. Fortunately, I'm in my house 15 years. In the last house, I was in 10 years. Exactly. I bought it in 91. I sold it in 2001. But this house suited me long enough that I could stay in it. But many people buy a bigger house, move under the water, want to buy a farm, want to downsize. You're in a condo first, then you buy a three-bedroom house, then you have three kids and you go, holy crap, I need a four-bedroom house. So you buy the four-bedroom house or you refinance and get cash to build the fourth bedroom, right? So the national average right now, it's sitting between six and seven and a half years that people keep that mortgage. With that said, you guys get ready to eat some pizza. I'm gonna to go to my office and answer these 12 phone calls and you're done for today. That concludes that section. Okay. Can you just make something. So you said you wanted to, you gave this to them last week for. Home You're going to complete it on yourself. Okay, so I can guess at the answers. I guess. Don't put your real social. <laughs> Don't put your. I mean, look, here's the, here's the deal. I'm not taking them, so it's yours. Okay. But if you don't fill it out, you're not going to have a basis of knowledge to ask me a question because you're going to be hearing this from me for the first time. But if you filled it out and you filled it out wrong, when I start explaining what it is, you're now going to take ownership of what you thought the wrong was, and you go, oh, that's what it meant. And that's okay. where we go with it. So on for the next class, we're just going to be finishing over the application? So, well, we're going to finish the next part. What's the next part? Section two, what does it say? The between the property information? And purpose of loan. Okay. We're, going to, we're going to work on that all the way till we get the borrower information. Okay. Because there's a lot of boxes there, huh? Yep. We're going to have to go through every one of them boxes. So these these classes are just based off of everything that's on this that application. And why? You see why? Why? Because, well, that's, a, that's like the whole loan process. This is it. Yeah. Without this, there's no loan. Yeah. If I don't get this information and verify this information, uh -huh. there's no loan. I'll give you one story I didn't give you last week. I, I kind of equate this whole process to different people being parts of different steps. So I look at this based on loan officers writing the mortgage, the application, processors verifying the information, and the underwriters saying, yes, we can do it or no, we can't. Those are the three main steps in this business. Are there stupid little things that go along in between? Yeah. So I turn around and say, you, you're the detective. Okay? You're the detective. You're out there going, so Bob, what do you do for a living? Um, how much do you make? I feel like Columbo. Uh, how much money do you make? 50,000. Well, how much money you got in the bank? Oh, you got 40,000 in the bank. Well, I need to pay stuff. You got to pay stuff. Information gather. You, you are the detective. You're talking to this person, gathering the information, and trying to make sure it's as accurate as can be here. Okay, so you're, you're going to get pay stubs, you're going to get the W-2s, you're going to get the tax returns to verify the, the capacity, and then to verify the money, bank statements, okay? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to look at where you rent and pay your mortgage and credit. So those are the big documents we get. Mm -hmm. So once you do all that and hand it in, the processor is now the district attorney. They got to make a case and present it to the judge. Who's the judge? The underwriter. The underwriter. 
That's right. So the now case. the prosecutor's like, hey, man, let's do, uh, what is it, NYPD Blue or whichever one's out there today. <laughs> so you raped the girl, huh? Give me the story. <laughs> they said, uh, the proverb said that uh, he was over there, but he wasn't there. He was over here. Now they're turning around, taking all the information and making sure it stands up to par. Well, they guy told me that he was over there, but I got an easy pass record that said he was over here. That's what they do. Now all of a sudden we start pulling reports. We run 4506s. We're getting everything. Oh, well, wait a minute. It's got 40,000 in a bank, but 32,000 of that 40 was deposited yesterday. Where'd it come from? Did they borrow money and put it in a bank and now they got to pay that payment that we don't know about? Because if I think your monthly payments are going to be 1500 but you borrowed 38000 from somebody at 600 a month, well, maybe you don't qualify because that 600 bucks a month changes the whole picture. Yeah. So that processor is verifying that the pay stub you gave me is right. We call the, the, the job. Hey, fill out this form. Bob says he makes 40000 I got a pay stub. People have made fake pay stubs before. People have had fake pay. So we verify everything. The processor is a prosecutor. They're building the case. And then that case, it's sent to the underwriter who goes, oh, we got the 3% down. Oh, we're using 5% as a rate. Bob makes 40,000 a year. He's got 32,000 in a bank. And then they're looking at the program because these underwriters got to know FHA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Bob's Mortgage, every different product we have that underwriter's got to know about. So she may have to pull out the book. She may have to look in the computer, but now she's going to verify that that information matches the program that we're using, and then we get an approval or denial. She's the judge, or he's the judge, whoever the underwriter is. We got men and women that are both. They, they assess the risk for both you and the lender. They, they verify that what was presented matches the program we're going for. Now, i give you a quick example. So you get divorced, and your ex-wife wants to buy a house and wants to use the child support and alimony that you're paying. FHA says, we just need three months proof that you paid the last three months. So let's say you just got divorced three months ago. Conventional says they want six months. Can you get a conventional loan if you got divorced three months ago? I have to put that loan into a conventional, uh, to an FHA product. If I go conventional, what's gonna happen? We're gonna talk about, remember what we talked about? Children like ice, lenders are like children and children like ice cream. I don't like chocolate. You eat it. <laughs> I don't like six, three months of payments. I'm conventional. Mm -hmm. I want six months of payments. You take the loan back. Mm -hmm. But if I go FHA, yum, I love that chocolate. <laughs> I love it to death. I want some more. Give me some more. Give me some more. The that's overseen by, um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It's their own independent agencies. So again, Everything is very specific and very detailed. You need to know the product you're using. You need to know the guidelines. You got to see how it relates. That's why we have all of us as part of a team. You may not know, and your process goes, whoa, we got to switch this, Ed. Ed we got to go FHA because you, want, you only got four months of payments, not six, and we're closing next week. We got to flip the whole loan over, change, reject that loan, open a new loan, move all the pay park into the new loan, and there you go. Got it? Yeah. Go, go enjoy, get some water, get some drinks. I'm going to go back to work. Oh, thank you. Who else has their? Bring them up, bring them up, and bring it to me. So, guys. <clears throat> I can't let them know we were ending these requests. Okay, cool. Guys, listen. I already sent out uh, yesterday's, bring, uh, let last week's class. Bring out all the chairs. I sent that out to you guys. We, uh, I was, this, 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 today's session was recorded. I'll send the playback for today's we have video and audio so you can get a visual with it. We're excited, guys. I mean, those of you, we, I'm going to sit down with my buddy here and work out the I'm just as we're ready, I'm ready to roll this out within the next week or so. Uh, we're, we're just putting out getting all the particulars. I mean, we still announced what we did last week, Monday. We had what, 35 referrals, and some of you guys are, are, are already are jumping on us with a bit. And um, the other last part of it is the 
those of you in, in, interested in trying to get your licensing, that's fine, absolutely fine. And, and uh, this class here is a, it's a, it's a complimentary class that we're offering that you would ordinarily pay from $150 to $300. The gentleman teaching this class was my partner 30 years ago. He's been, a, he's owned two mortgage companies. He's now a senior vice president of a top mortgage banker firm all across the country. And I'm gonna tell you something, you, can't, you couldn't learn from a better guy. So, you know, the, 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 our relationships, we're gonna be doing the same thing for real estate, for, real, for, for Century 21 and Weikert and other people to that nature. And we're also going to be doing the same thing for student loans and automobile loans. So we're gonna roll them out in phases. We have some major, major announcements that's gonna take place in the next few days. Guys, I'm gonna tell you, if you was on the call Sunday night and I was telling you about getting your power back, understand where we're going. We got some major things about to happen. So I know I'm just preparing you for the journey. Um, we'll, we'll be making some announcements uh, over the next few days, tomorrow night. Uh, all, so those of you who are the key leaders, you can get a text to get on the, on the call. And then we're gonna, uh, those of you in Florida, I'm gonna be down to see Uncle Les on Sunday. I'll be in Florida on Sunday. And all of our Florida team members, I definitely need to get with you guys. I'm, I'm there for one day, I'm, fl I'm flying in Sunday, you're flying out Monday, but I need to get with you. Uh, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm going straight to the, he's at Uncle Les at the rehab. So as soon as I fly in, I'm going out to the rehab. Uh, then we can probably meet maybe Sunday evening, or we all can meet at the rehab. But, but Sunday evening, uh, we'll try to get together all the you know, our partners there and the, the leaders in the Florida market, and kind of give you a little heads up of where of where we're at and what's happening. Uh, and, and then the last piece is going to be, um, you know, I just came out, I just came from Atlanta yesterday, and I got I got a, a few other states I got to hit. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. We're, gonna, we're about to put a game plan together, a 90-day game plan that's going to wrap, wrap – I mean, no other company ever offered real estate as a network marketing. And the, plan, and the thing we got together as a – this is going to be listed as a lead generation, so the, these companies can pay us as lead generator, generating leads, but those when they get licensing will actually get paid as a licensed agent. And my agreement is – it got the deals go to my guys first before it goes to the company. So as long as there's a licensed agent, we got licensed agents. So there's going to be a great opportunity for you to recruit uh, brokers and loan officers. And, you know, you're going, to, you're, going to have to, you're going to learn more as the time goes by. So with that being said, guys, today's class is over. Uh, I will send that playback out and I'll talk to you guys real soon. And again, we got the big webinar uh, tomorrow evening. God bless and everybody have a good day.